Hey everybody, welcome back. Uh, let me get that light out of the way. Um, and uh, hope you had a good break. Um, so yeah, I know this probably again a little late in coming, but we have the uh, this this is now your opportunity to study up for the midterm. Um, in some ways, actually, there's a good thing that's coming this late because I was able to see like who's participating, who's not before. I, so I can actually get you guys going on the midterm because a few people, to be honest with you, didn't turn their uh, oral presentation ideas. That's going to lead to a half grade, um, unless otherwise indicated. Um, that's going to there's actually three people who haven't still haven't turned theirs in. That's going to lead to a half grade lower on the oral presentation grade, overall grade. So sorry about that, but that is part of um doing the assignment is to uh, actually give me a proposal that i can approve so um all right so you know that's obviously due later in april but now we have the midterm let's go to actually the uh share the screen here um and i have a pinwheel there we go all right so um let's actually go to the um the actual, this will be, again, I'm doing this ahead of time. So this will be posted on Monday. And it says the midterm study guide is posted. Well, it will be posted. And I will discuss it in my in my March lectures. Okay, so it's right here. So you can download it from here. The actual exam will be, att will be attached to a midterm exam assignment, po assignment post 9 a.m. on Monday, March 27th. So that's a week from today. So please watch for that. And... You will have three days to complete that exam after it's given to you a week from now, March 27th. You must submit it as a Microsoft Word doc to the midterm assignment post, okay? Let's remember to do that, okay? And then the exam's five questions, only five questions will be based on the five of the seven points outlined in the study guide that I'm gonna talk about today. Just imagine if it were the five of the points I raise were turned into questions, essentially five of the points in the study guide, okay? Each answer needs to be at least 300 words, okay? And, you know, just imagine if it was like the old fashioned blue book, only now you're doing it on um, on an actual Microsoft Word doc. Um, you need to structure your answer this way. State your answer as an opinion, but back it up with evidence, fact, or facts. Okay, so basically you can say some of the examples again that we've used this semester, um, you know, whether it's like Watergate or um you know uh, you know the uh the the, the uh, bad the bad tires in, in texas and that sort of thing okay but you know you can use the book as a reference too to help point you in the right direction okay um and we'll go over that part um so basically like you know i don't care whether you i agree with you or not on your opinion but what i care is that you actually can back it up okay um okay so let's go to the actual midterm, okay? Uh, study guide, all right? Chapters one through nine. So, I mean, I actually give you the, even the chapters here. What are some of the main points or main goals that journalists share? How do journalists share the public's trust while meeting the, press, the profession's bottom line? Okay, so remember like when I talked about this, I talked about how I have maybe like highlighted certain areas to help guide you. Um, and if we actually look at chapter one, how do we, what sort of values do we share the bottom line? Um, you know, I highlighted the fact that like, you know, that KHOU report about the tires that caused accidents, examples of thoroughly reported, well-told news stories. Nearly everyone would agree that they are first-rate journalism. We would, we, would, we would take it a step further and say ethify ethical journalism because the whole idea with that case, again, is that it wasn't necessarily viewed as the most ethical approach in the beginning because they were just taking a few reports and just, you know, going from there. Um, but it was almost, again, that the ends justify the means. They went through the process and they handled it carefully. They used tact and they came out with something that actually ended up helping people. And then the chapter goes into like what fueled that story. And then basically, um, well, this is something that it's also it's almost a, it's also a selling point because remember there's also a dollar motivation um, behind what we do in journalism and, and ethics is a, se a selling point. So we try to inform the public about incidents, trends, and developments of society and government. 
journalists are obliged to gather information as best they can to tell and to tell the truth as they find it. To treat people, both those in the audience and those who are making the news with fairness, respect, even compassion, okay? And to nurture the democratic process for people to govern themselves at issues, but basically helping them be informed. So no matter if it's Twitter and they have an agenda or whatever, or some social media platform, or it's a news organization, what you should try to get out of that information is like what's supposed to basically better inform you, okay? All right, so that's chapter one. Let me flip, switch now to chapter two, which actually gets into the philosophers and um, what, actually, let me just go back here. We discussed several philosophers in class, two philosophers and academics who have discussed principles that are controversial, but have served as guiding principles for journalists when, they're, when they've either justified or rationalized their actions. So the discussion would be essentially, what is the potter's box and how can we apply it to one of the ethics cases we've applied, we've had in class, okay? I mean, I don't want to give away too much of the answer there, but basically, like, uh, you know, we have it right here. We have different philosophers right here. Socrates and how basically he believes in follow-up questions and essentially Socratic method, thoroughly going through the process to make sure everything is well-informed and healed, okay? We had Plato in the New Republic, which talked about how, you know, no matter what, we should realize that you know, there's animalistic drives that drive people, but there's also, it's also balanced with reasons and when we have what we report and what we uncover, okay? Um, then there's Aristotle with the gold mean, looking at, in, like, right in the middle between two extremes. Um, you know, and, and I mean, some of the things we've talked about in that, again, looking at, you know, Watergate, um, you could argue with the way they handled things by going off the going off the record and like maybe sticking their foot in people's doors, stuff like that. And maybe it's the extreme form, but the but but the of, of journalism, you could argue. But on the other hand, what they what they came up was like the only real process way to get there. And they didn't lie, they didn't cheat, they did get some things wrong, but you know, they fell short of that extreme point because they were able to do it in a way that actually like they showed care to people, they showed that they were able to you know, speak to pe up the, the people's level, not down to people, the reporters, Carl Bernstein and, Rod and Bob Woodward, okay? Um, social contract and Hobbes. Um, again, that's like basically knowing your audience. And that's why I basically kind of justified, despite the fact that Fox News has actually like done some things that actually have <laughs> obviously recently have been really questionable. Um, the fact of the matter is, is that they probably do some things that are good. And, you know, again, a lot of conservatives, again, felt left out of the process, the journalism process, because they felt like there were a lot of news that, that they actually cared about um, um, that actually isn't being reported on the so-called liberal news media channels. OK. Um, OK. And then, like, you know, utilitarianism is basically about the greatest good for the greatest number. Um, you know, basically, again, like that's more of a kind of an ends justify the means, which I would also say is Kant is very similar in that way. Basically, you know, that's more of means justify the ends. Basically, you, you essentially like go through the, the process correctly, carefully, that sort of thing. And don't forget the potter's box, okay? The empirical definition that's basically where you state the problem. So, in, in the case of like, um, the tire situation, the, this thing is, did they handle it ethically? We identify the value, that's the gut check. You know, um, did they, you know, did they go through the process that you're basically were raised with, you know, born with? Um, do you personally feel it was ethical, what they did? Um, feel ethical principles, then you could basically choose essentially one of the philosophers that actually like might apply to that case. You choose loyalties, you see like, there's any potential conflict of interest in your thinking or in their thinking, and then and then that you may make a decision. Okay, so please read up on that. Okay, um, now let's go to the next one, chapter three. Basically, journalists seek the truth, but are they truly objective? Has it become less objective because of the changing landscape? Okay, um, so I mean, basically, that that could deal with things like blog blogging of course but also like things like social media um and how we've seen that affect elections in recent years um 
you know, basically they talked about some of the other uh, philosophers embraced certain philosophies that could be applied to now. And then as the way to understand the world is to observe it closely and to classify what it's seen. You know, facts and opinions are separate things and facts are basis of truth. And this again applies to there's so many things that are posted on social media are all like not not fact. And we've seen so many issues with these in recent years with 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 the fact that like you know, so many people leave many of the things that are actually said on social media when they when they're, when they're not exactly true. Okay, and people can objectively obtain facts. For example, scientists can be trusted to read a thermometer or read temperature correct. Scientific developments are making the world a better place. I mean, we could probably look at that and apply that to maybe the whole vaccine truth against the lies that have been printed on, I believe, on the on 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 social media. Okay. Um this also talked about like you know, how both sides are ism, you know, basically the whole idea of how, um, you know, trying to balance out the balance out opinions by getting the pro and con. Does that really apply to certain things that are happening today? Is there really a pro and con to like the January 6th insurrection, for instance? Um, so, you know, that so is 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 there a, is there a pro to that? That basically is the, as I talked about, the most attainable version of the truth um uh, which bob what we're talked about or is that just just it's just, just just a good and bad side to that okay chapters four through six talk about is it okay to make a mistake um and you know basically what i could tell you about that is essentially is that you know the um the supreme court ruled this too and that is that uh you know people are allowed to make a mistake because they're human uh, reporters um, the question is, I mean, what does your audience believe? You know, what and 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 it, when is it too many? Um, so, you know, the problem with the New York Times is that if you do make errors, you know, you are not supposed to be making errors. So, if you make an error occasionally, not a big deal. People should understand it. It should be like some sort of contract with the audience to basically understand that that's just part of what happens. Okay. Um, but then if you do it repeatedly, as we talked about with Jason Blair, the reporter from 20 years ago who made con consistent mistakes, you know, that's going against like what your audience expects you to do. Um, but then there's, of course, that there's like essentially made up news. Um, there's the opinion, there's, there's, there's the onion, you know, and you could argue that's ethical because it has a certain contract with the audience that, um, that what they're going to print essentially is false. <laughs> uh, but is, but Fox News, that's a, that's a good question. Is that actually something that actually is it's going on right now? They're being sued because of a lot of things that were said during the election. They tried to fan the flames of this, um, believing that these voting machines from Old Dominion were um, were um, were not working correctly and were actually maybe even sabotaged in the Democrats' favor. favor that proved, and now Old Dominion is actually suing them because it, it fairly looks like that's, that was an untrue statement. And they actually might win this libel case. So in that particular case, even though Fox News says a lot of things are exaggerated and hyperbole, they do have a contract they, with their people that produce the truth. And so right now they're being called out for that. Of course, I've also heard people say that like a lot of people watch Fox News just expect them to lie every now and then, and <laughs> that's just they just want somebody to yell and scream for them and for their side of the side of the political aisle. So, um, so. I mean, is that ethical? What's going on with the old Dominion case? Um, so yeah, this is actually chapters three and four. Um, five, you know, it talks about how the media can improve and um, question persistently. Reporters should should have fired just the questions that you'd be will be sources. You can't like I always go through this uh, exercise with my writing for media class, and that is, you know, they have to like basically write a lead for certain stories, certain information that's pieces of information that are given to them. And one of them is that um, they have to, there's this attempted murder case. And a lot of them, when they write this lead for this story, all they do is they write about the attempted murder, but they don't go further and they find out what the motivation for the attempted murder was. And what the motivation was, was that uh, a woman was trying to or set her husband on fire because he ate her chocolate Easter bun. So you have to actually like always try to like go into depth to see like what's behind the actual story. What is the angle there? Um, because sometimes it's actually also a better way of understanding like how these things happen, especially crimes. Um, I've done a lot of that again in like mental health cases. Um, 
where we've seen a lot of issues involving the mental people who are mentally ill. Um, is it a question of criminality or is it a question of mental illness behind some of these crimes that take place? Um, be upfront about verification. Obviously, you want to basically attribute and let people know like like when you know you make where this information is coming from because a lot of people don't really trust that. Chris, always correct mistakes. You know, even if it's like a small box in the news organization, please make sure that you do that. Okay, because at least people will know that you're actually like keeping watch of yourself and being your own ombudsman. Okay, and I mentioned about attribution. Don't rush things. It's always be better to be right than first, even in today's so you know social media world. Okay. Um. Okay, so now we're on to transparency. Let's see what else we got here. That's actually chapter six. Still chapter seven. Examine the importance of reporters and editors establishing the credibility of sources. I actually just want to really go through this quickly to see if there's any um thing else that I've missed. Okay. Um doesn't look like it so far. Baking the news, we talked about that. Obviously, like, again, the onion. We talked about Jason Blair. That's actually mentioned right here. The onion exists because it makes people laugh, and they they know it's not true. So there's an audience contract there. Um, okay, and staging the news. I mean, there's actually like we talked about photography and how that's an issue and how. Um, you know, basically, like it was, it was maybe times when actually, like, fudging a photograph, like what happened with the Kent State photograph, where the pole was removed. Um, and by the way, this is all basically on past lectures. If you haven't seen them, so I don't feel like there's a really need to repeat them. Um, but basically, they moved, they moved the pole from, it looked like it was coming out of a woman's head. Um, and, uh, you know, I felt personally that that was actually like the, more unethical thing to do because it took away from the actual story. But then on the other hand, you had the story, the picture of Iraq where they literally like the photo there to make it look like the soldier was threatening a child and, a, and his father. Um, but that was actually basically just changed the whole truth of the story in that particular case. So that wasn't correct. Um, okay. So chapter seven, working with sources. Um, um, examine the importance of reporters and editors to establish credibility of sources. Particular story, how many sources are enough? How close the relationship should be? Um, you know, basically, like, you rely on government sources, that sort of thing, but you should always get more than one source. And you try to get always, I mean, sometimes you're not going to be able to do that, but because, like, you got maybe police matters and crime matters, and you have to get the, in that particular case, you have to get the story out, and then maybe you follow up for more information. But you know, you always try to get like more than one perspective. And then this may go against what I said before about both siderism, but I actually like to think it's like kind of a multi-perspective to what you're trying to get for this, for your stories. And that is, you always try to get one, especially like with a profile or something, you know, the, the person you're profiling isn't always the best source for your story because they're biased. So you try to get somebody else to try to balance, I should say balance out, but also add additional perspective and it could be a good perspective, that's fine, but you always want to try to get more than one perspective to a story so that basically you can get more information, get closer to the most attainable version of the truth, and it'll be less biased, okay? Um, I mean, there's nothing wrong with actually like seeking out conflict in the story, that sort of thing, but if there is that, okay? Um, but you shouldn't manufacture it. Um, you know, basically a reporter's relationship with, with, with sources you don't want to become too dependent um, because the thing there is that, you know, you want to develop respect. You want them to respect you, but friendship can actually definitely like shade and color what's, you know, what, what how your reporting may come out. And that's what happened again with this case involving Judith Miller, the New York Times, who apparently had a relationship with um, this man who was giving feeding information about the Iraq war that turned out to be lies. who worked for Dick Cheney, okay? Um, so, you know, in that particular case, and then there was she was she was hired by Fox News, isn't that great? Um, <laughs> chapters eight and nine, the government watch, and that again is the last point that's made here. Role is you know, media plays a role. Is, do they play? Do they play a role as legitimate watchdog? 
And I mean, the one thing that I mean, it's always brought up in this is again, the Watergate scandal. That was obviously I mean, the best case where like we found out so much about the government. But also look at the Trump administration where so many things went on there that could actually lead to his indictment. Um, so, you know, <laughs> that basically affected his judgment and the way he went about things as to become president and also when he was president. Um, the things to remind here, and I point to this section of the book right here, is that government controls many aspects of life. This justifies why we do what we do. You take away freedoms, imprison people, regulate businesses, impose tariffs, and post taxes and tariffs. Okay, so basically, they're supposed to be working for us. Okay, so you know, that's so they have our dollars. So we have the right to basically kind of pry. There are some exceptions to that, obviously, and that would be. Along the lines of, you know, basically personnel information, national security information, lawsuit information is actually protected yeah. by the law, and reporters are not necessarily. I mean, they could, they, of course, they get the information if they're allowed, but but the sources and the government sources allowed to keep it away from them too. It's considered that's that's a matter. It's considered a right of privacy issues that could affect um, the ultimate judgment of a case, litigation case, that sort of thing, or even investigation. Um, again, government runs on tax dollars. That's that's important. We talked about that. And democracy, citizens can make a difference. They can influence government by voting, attending public hearings, and voicing their feelings. Okay, so that's chapters. And whoa, well, I'm sorry, chapters nine to ten. That's actually, I'm sorry, that's actually Watergate and two. You could answer the same thing. Um, basically, if you want, you can use the same example twice. Watergate could be used there, but it also could be used if I asked both questions. Um, remember, I'm going to take five out of seven here. Watergate um, could be like another um, case of maybe where anonymous sources were appropriately used because, again, the ends justify the means in that particular case. It was the only way they could get information on Nixon and what he was doing and what his henchmen were doing to basically influence the 1972 election. Um, so yeah, sometimes it's the only way to get information about police. That's how like the uh, the videos that have been obtained have been a, a lot of them, been a, you know, about what the police are doing and some of the bad things that have gone on involving the police. So you, you know, sometimes those things are leaked and that's the only way to get them. So that's when anonymous source again is actually appropriately used, okay? Um, so anyway, I want you guys to really just kind of study up on those and really come up with your own examples which is why I didn't, I, I, I talked about them. I didn't directly cite them or show them. Um, and also I've talked about them in past lectures. So anyway, so please study up on that this week. And uh, if you have any questions about it at all, please, you're confused about like what kinds of questions I might ask or whatever, please do so. Um, remember again, I'm picking, I'm, there's seven points and I'm picking five of those to become questions for the exam, and that'll be something, the exam again will be released a week from Monday, on March 27th, and then you'll have three days to do it by March 30th, okay? So thanks very much, everybody, and I will be talking to you.